Welcome everybody. I'm Johanna Arendt with Travis County Balcones Canyonlands Preserve. And uh, this is, this Wild Neighbor Speaker Series is a collaboration of um, the Travis County Balcones Canyonlands Preserve and City of Austin Balcones Canyonlands Preserve, which are managed by uh, the Natural Resources Program at Travis County and the um, Wildlands Conservation Program at the City of Austin. We're really happy to welcome Dr. Pamela Owen today to speak to us about armadillos. Um, and I wanted to just talk a little bit about the Balcones Canyonlands Preserve, which is hosting this program. Before we get started, it'll be short and sweet. Um, so we created this program as a way to connect folks with experts like Dr. Owen about the wildlife that we see in our area. As a very large urban preserve, um, we get a lot of questions from, from folks about all the wildlife we see. And so this is a great way to uh, get all those questions answered and have that as a, a resource going forward online since this will be recorded and available moving forward on our websites and on uh, social media. So just moving forward on the slide, if I can, there we go. So that's a map of the Balcones Canyonlands Preserve, if you're not already familiar with it. It's pretty massive, it's 50 square miles, actually a little bit over that, which is one of the largest urban preserves in the country. And it's managed by lots of partners, as you can see from the different colors there. There's a, um, a legend down in the lower left-hand corner there, so you can see who everybody is. Um, and it's an oasis of wildness in the city here. Uh, it was corrected, created to protect endangered and threatened species. And by doing that, it also protects the entire amazing rich ecosystem that we have here in the Balcones Canyonlands. Um, it was also created as a form of mitigation. The land in this um, preserve was create, I'm sorry, was is, will be protected in perpetuity. Um, and that was done in exchange for allowing the majority of endangered species habitat in Western Travis County to be developed into roads and houses and, and all the things that we you know, have to sustain our community. But um, in exchange for allowing that land to be developed, we've uh, set aside this really massive over 30,000 acre preserve here, which is really a, a gem um, and a, a wonderful resource, um, not only for wildlife, but also for the community. Um, in addition to doing all the things that wildlands do naturally, like you know, um, uh, helping to clean the water and air, uh, mitigating flood and erosion, um, and uh, helping to mitigate the effects of climate change. It's also a resource for the community, um, community of wildlife, here are the protected species, and community of uh, people surrounding the preserve and in the larger community. Um, we have a lot of educational programs like this, um, guided hikes during non-COVID times, and also volunteer opportunities that, that are come up and are on our, our um, calendar. So please do get involved and get engaged and stay connected with us. We um, are looking forward to connecting with you even more once, once COVID has subsided. Um, so here are a couple of links that are, uh, we could give you a billion links, but here are two that will really be good to get you started. The first one is an interactive map of the preserve showing what areas are open to the public. And the second is a, a the story of the BCP. They'll give you the background and all the partners and how to get involved. It's a really good resource that the city of Austin has. Um, so, Without further ado, I'd like to introduce our speaker for today. Dr. Pamela Owen is the Associate Director of the Texas Memorial Museum, which is the Natural History Museum at UT Austin. If you haven't been there yet, it's a really wonderful place. She's a mammologist and vertebrate paleontologist, uh, and she's been an informal science educator for 21 years. She has done research on saber-toothed cats, American lions, coyotes, and dire wolves, among many other things. So she's really one of the coolest people you'll ever be, to be honest. Uh, so she's extremely knowledgeable and always really wonderful to hear from. Um, and so if you have questions for Dr. Owen during the presentation, please put it in the Q&A uh, section down at the bottom, uh, not in the chat section. So put it in the Q&A and at the end, my colleague Jeremy Hall will be reading those questions to Dr. Owen for, for discussion. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen so that Dr. Owen can share hers. Oh, 
Okay. Let's, everyone sees the screen, I hope. Good afternoon. Um, I am so happy to be talking with you today about armadillos, which um, are this fabulous creature, in my personal opinion. Uh, throughout history, you know, they've played different roles with different people in terms of um, attitudes and experiences. And uh, I kind of want to start with just two of my favorite memories about armadillos. Uh, once I moved here from California, moved to Texas, I, I got to know armadillos uh, very well. Two in particular. One is, is that uh, uh, I went camping in, at the Guadalupe River State Park uh, one summer uh, weekend and uh, spent the night following armadillos. Uh, I was entertaining my sister who was in from out of town who wanted to see live armadillos, not, uh, not a road killed armadillo, but some live armadillos. And so uh, we had gone camping and yeah, so fall around flashlights, it was very exciting. And uh, we thought, wow, we got our fill of armadillos. But uh, what was crazy is they kept us up all night rooting around the tent, making grunting noises, kind of, kind of uh, uh, just, a circus. I had never heard or seen so much activity. So that's something that's kind of near and dear to my heart, that memory. And then my second memory is um, kind of associated with some of my background and looking at deep time and looking at the fossil record. And I participated in a program, oh, uh, about 10 years ago that was on the Discovery Channel called Prehistoric Dallas. And I had the opportunity to meet and hold a live nine-banded armadillo called Speed Bump. Um, as part of this television program. And obviously I was talking about uh, armadillos and some of their extinct relatives. And I'll use my little pointer here to point this out. Um, the glyptodont that I have here um, on this title slide. Um, that's the, our giant fossil armadillo that we have at Texas Memorial Museum. And so I always love to talk about armadillos. So I'm so happy to share some information about them and kind of look at them in terms of uh, deep time. So let's see if we can forward. Yeah, this way. Okay, so when you say armadillo, especially in the Austin area, you you might not even think about roadkill armadillos or live armadillos running across the street or you know these little armored tanks that are digging little holes in your backyard. You might come across them with all this fabulous advertising. So it, armadillos have become rather iconic, especially here in Austin. We see them utilized in businesses and and big public events. And so armadillos, you know, very, very popular uh, figure in terms of our, you know, pop culture. So let's just get back, think about what armadillo means and the names and the titles to kind of give it some um, place and, and you know, give them some respect. So starting off with the scientific name, I love uh, the, the scientific names. They got such great history with them. And so this, the name, the science, scientific name for armadillos is from Linnaeus. Uh, is Dasypus novum cinctus, and it's, he Latinized the Greek word for hair, Dasypus, with novum cinctums, with, which means nine belts. So novum meaning nine, cinctus meaning belt. So you think about a cinch. And so that's where our Texas armadillo gets its scientific name. Um, before Linnaeus, you know, our native peoples of Texas and, and Central America, we have languages, Nahuatl is one of them, and so Ayotochtli is the name for armadillos, which is roughly translated as turtle rabbit. And of course, the Spanish, when they came into Texas, the name armadillo, you're looking at little armored one. During the 30s, during the Great Depression, Texans often used different names for armadillos. And that included names such as Hoover hog, poverty pig, poor man's pig, because they were a food source. And armadillos have been a food source for for centuries, for thousands of years. Uh, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. And then one point I wanna make is that, you know, our armadillo actually has a state title. It was adopted as a Texas small state mammal on the 16th of June in 1995 by House Concurrent Resolution number 178. And it was signed by Governor George W. Bush. So yes, our nine banded armadillo has some respect. It is our Texas small, state mammal. 
So what is an armadillo? So if we look at family trees, if you look at the tree on the left, that shows you Singulata, that's just the name for armadillos and their kin. And we're familiar with our single species, but they're very, very diverse in South America. So Singulata is, is the armadillo group, and they're related to anteaters and sloths. And they belong to a group we call the Xenarthra. And Xenarthra means strange joints. And I'll show you an image of where that comes from. If we look into the armadillo family tree in detail, you can see that all those branches, we've got extinct and extant. So those are the living species, different groups. Our armadillo belongs to this group here, the Dazipodines. Uh, so we'll be mostly talking about this group this morning. But I will point out the glyptodonts, this creature right here with this really strange kind of you know, bulldog-like skull. I'll point out the glyptodonts because we have a nice local record. Uh, to compare with our, our living species. So we'll focus on those two, just to give you an idea of kind of family relationships. So I mentioned Xenarthra, the name Strange Joints, and that name comes from the fact that there's an extra articulation. So we're looking at the bones that make up the back, the vertebral column, of a rabbit with a nine-banded armadillo. And so in most mammals, we've got kind of a single kind of connection with our, what we call a zygopophysis, but we also have an extra connection between vertebrae that's called a xenarthrus process. So it's just an extra, extra joint, extra connection. And it's thought that a lot of that uh, anatomy may have provided some extra stability because those of you that know and love, or maybe know and not so love, um, armadillos and their digging capabilities, you know, they are transmitting a lot of forces as they're moving those forelimbs. And so perhaps that you know, the vertebral column can assist with that. The Xenarthron is a group, so armadillos and the sloths and the anteaters are also well known for their claws. So I've been mentioning digging, we really know that, that's something that they all share in common. But when we really focus on armadillos, we see something really interesting, especially our long-nosed group, the Dazipodids, where our nine-banded belong, really long snout with these tiny little peg-like teeth. And what's interesting about all the members of Xenarthra is that their teeth lack enamel. So that really hard, shiny stuff that you know, protects the crowns of our teeth, we don't see that. So they have mineralized teeth, just no enamel on there. And they're, they're really, they're peg-like. And they have a 30 to 32 total within their upper and lower jaws. So they've got a really kind of long snout with these teeth. And you kind of think, well, you know, um, those teeth, what are they? Are they great for chewing things? Well, I kind of look at them as kind of exoskeleton crunchers. Uh, they're not going to be really going to town grinding, um, you know, and, and slicing, but you know, basically piercing the prey that they eat. But these teeth, you'll notice that it's mostly just the back teeth. You don't see any, you know, canines or, or uh, incisors up in the front. Everything's going on in the back. So they kind of look like a very tiny, like a miniature, like dolphin skull. What makes armadillos, of course, very famous is that the armor itself. And what's really interesting about this armor, it's different from the armor that we see in reptiles like turtles uh, or you know, some of the osteoderms that we see in the skin of alligators and crocodiles. This armor is dermal, which means it grows in the dermal layer of the skin. So unlike a turtle or a tortoise, you may be aware that their shell is formed from not only the sternum, but also you know, their vertebral column. So it's a completely different way of armoring itself. With the armadillos, it's all within the skin. And so you've got then what we call these little osteoderms, individual plates that are covered with this keratin layer, the plates over that. So the armor is really interesting because it gives protection and yet you know, some amount of flexibility some amount of flexibility. So when we look at our living armadillo, you're, you're looking at animals that are roughly, what, um, uh, a foot and a half long. They're little, you know, 12 pound tanks. The females tend to be a little bit uh, less, way less than the males. So you know, your average weights are gonna be somewhere between you know, eight and maybe 17 pounds maximum. Uh, moving it about, when we look at the armor itself, it's broken up into uh, what we call these bucklers. So we've got shoulder shield and uh, kind of hip shield. We've got the bands here. 
typically nine, but do know that the, our nine banded armadillos can have between seven and 11. So there's a little bit of genetic play in there. So, but you know, averaging with nine. So those are the bands here that give it some flexibility. Um, our armadillos cannot roll into a ball. So they can kind of do the cashew, can bend, it gives them that flexibility there, but there's only one species of armadillo and it's in South America that can literally roll up into a ball. So the stories about uh, our Texas armadillos rolling up into a ball and, and heading downhill, um, those are all stories. You'll notice also that the armor extends all the way down to the tail. So we've got these rings of armor here. And then there's a little face shield that covers up the snout. And so that makes up the armor. And the underside is all skin and, and it's lightly haired. And so uh, one thing that really struck me when I held speed bump was that uh, he was dumping a lot of heat. You could really feel his belly that, that were some of the heat, but obviously not a super warm animal. Uh, they have relatively you know, low body temperatures. And so we are typically seeing them in environments where um, not only do we have you know, plenty of water, but we don't have long extended you know, freezing cold winters. Armadillos are known for digging. And uh, so again, the claws, the front feet have four major claws. You know, four digits and then the hind feet have five. Those claws are really robust and of course they use them to create these dens that um, can have more than one opening and uh, they use leaves and grass to, to bed those down. Some of these uh, burrows actually act as food traps. So all kinds of really cool invertebrates that are moving about in the soil or dropping in to some of these, these burrows, um, you know, it's, it's like they have their own little, you know, cache of food. So they have sort of a sleeping burrow and then they might have some other entrances that kind of serve as these food traps. But this is what a lot of people kind of uh, recognize and, and might be concerned with, especially on your property if you're concerned with, you know, armadillo damage about, you know, all the digging. Um, but one thing I will say about, you know, armadillo burrows is that quite often um, their burrows serve as great uh, shelter spaces for other wild creatures. So everything from rattlesnakes, you know, to um, uh, ground squirrels to, and other animals um, take advantage of these burrows. Burrows in general, if I were to kind of, you know, if you wanted to go out in your property and kind of and look for the best places for armadillo burrows, they're typically uh, moving soil that, that uh, is near streams or rivers or some kind of water source. So part of what we have learned at, with armadillo uh, kind of dispersal and distributions that soils do have um, some control about that. So places where there's a lot of clay. So if you move into like Blackland Prairie, you see fewer armadillos, but if you have sandier soils that are easier for them to move about, you're gonna see a higher abundance of those, those animals. So, what are they doing as they're digging around? Well, they're, they're looking for food. And despite some of the early uh, contentions that armadillos were consuming uh, corpses or destroying uh, the nests and the eggs of uh, ground dwelling birds, uh, predominantly their diet are in, in invertebrates. And so 93% of their diet, it's estimated is all animal-based proteins. So especially, you know, larval adult insects. And those include those insects that we humans find to be um, kind of detrimental to some of our agricultural practices uh, or, for, or termites. You think about just, you, you don't want termite infestations in your homes. Um, they're going after earthworms, millipedes, also known to take some crayfish. And then what few kind of non-animal materials that have been found in some studies of stomach contents include things um, like fungus, um, and, you know, every once in a while berries, but it's thought that perhaps they're not actually selecting for those items that they just happen to be as they're rooting around, snuffling things up that some of that material gets in there. But predominantly, yeah, we're looking at invertebrate material. So what's interesting about armadillos is that they have a seasonal activity pattern. So right now, uh, it's, we're, it's the start of um, kind of the birthing season. Uh, so 
we're going to start to see some switching in terms of being most active during kind of the, the warmest part of the day. As we move into the summer, we start to see them um, more active during the evening. So when I was out camping you know, in Guadalupe River, uh, that was in the summer. And so that's, we waited till nighttime. So they're moving about, you know, they do like the warmth, but you know, we know how it is in this, this Texas summer is like, gonna take the shade during the day. Uh, so weather like this, we're gonna see a little bit more activity where there's more sunshine and more warmth. And then also um, a time where the, the females are gonna start having young. Um, I already kind of talked a little bit about just kind of soil preferences and where some of the, the digging takes place. One really cool thing about armadillos is that we, we typically see them associated in places where we have, um, you know, permanent water source. So usually working along streams and riverbanks, um, they're also known to, you know, to go underwater and literally kind of run ac across the bottom of the stream to get to the other side. And what's interesting, um, it, they're also known for taking some air in, and it's not understood physiologically how this is happening, but somehow they are able to ingest air and kind of inflate part of their digestive system so they give them a little bit more buoyancy. Um, they, it's, it's not thought that they're purposely going into the water, um, searching for food or, you know, enjoying food, trying not to anthropomorphize, but it's not as if they're, you know, actively swimming, but apparently they've got this great adaptation that allows them to uh, deal with crossing uh, rivers or streams as needed. But a lot of their dispersal has been kind of following the major river systems. So I kind of briefly mentioned that we're, we're moving into our um, birthing season. So March is, you know, typically kind of becomes the, the, the high time that we start to see baby armadillos coming out of the, the birth burrow. And so one thing about our nine-banded armadillo has got two ways of, of reproducing that are really, really interesting. The first component is, is that they express what is called delayed implantation, which means that the fertilized egg after mating uh, doesn't actually implant within the uterine wall. So it kind of free floats for a while before implanting uh, about 14 weeks after fertilization. So that's typically, you know, we're thinking, so a lot of the mating really kicks into gear in July. So 14 weeks later, it's gonna be that November, we'll get implantation. And it's thought that that delay is, a, is an adaptation so that the young are not born in the middle of winter, which again, because armadillos are not the greatest thermoregulators, uh, you know, they lose so much heat, you know, obviously they're not hairy. Uh, that this is a great adaptation that's allowed for their success. So having that, what's interesting is that once that fertilized egg then starts to divide and go through the process of, of developing into embryos, nine-banded armadillos also uh, have what we call uh, polyembryony, which means that they give birth to multiple identicals. And in the case of our nine-banded armadillos, they're quads. So all the you know, babies, you get four identical quadruplets. That's the typical, um, that's the way that they reproduce. Um, so it's, it's absolutely fascinating. So you have the, the youngsters out and you, got, you can see the four out here identicals. When the youngsters are born, they, um, uh, eyes are open. They're kind of really, really ready to go. It, it's within hours, they're moving about. They do have their dermal armor in place, but it's not solid. So it gives them that flexibility and it's not going to get kind of to the solid state that we see uh, until they're adults. So moving into that, that first year. So that gives them that flexibility, that growth. But you can see the armor and you can see the, the osteoderm pattern on them. They um, really only nurse for probably less than, you know, two months. And then they're ready to go forage and hang out with mom. They actually kind of stay with the mother, it's thought, for some time, but foraging for the worms and the, the insects and things that, that makes up their diet. All right, so speaking of diet, um, what and who eat armadillos? So it's interesting, we, we think about in the wild, uh, quite often, especially if you're talking to school-age children, you're thinking about, okay, predator-prey relationships, you know, who's eating armadillos? And it's interesting, 
most of the, the our main predators will at times take armadillos. So that it would include uh, our wildlife, local wildlife like coyotes and bobcats. Uh, but we also um, see some dogs as the main killers of armadillos, as well as feral hogs are, are, have been documented in Texas as predators of especially the young. Uh, I will say that humans have been consuming armadillos for thousands of years. And uh, we have people today are still consuming armadillos. And uh, I honestly have not tried it. I think uh, if someone would offer me armadillo, I definitely would try. Uh, from what I've read and from descriptions from folks that have traveled not only here in Texas and in, in Louisiana and Mexico and into uh, Central and Southern Americas, that the dishes that are prepared, that they're, it's uh, been equated to, to pork, so you can't use the old like, taste like chicken story with armadillo. Uh, but yeah, people have been consuming armadillos for, for, for thousands and thousands of years. And armadillos do make up a prey item for you know, some of our local wildlife. So where do we find armadillos in Texas? Just about all over the state. So this is a, a map. Uh, you can see the gray shaded area is where we see them. So just that kind of far western, really dry re uh, regions of the state, we don't see um, armadillos. The black dots are just official county records. So just the seeing no black dot in Williamson County doesn't mean there's no armadillos there. Those are just the official records. Um, this is from the online version of the Mammals of Texas, which is a great resource if you um, are not familiar with it. One of the great stories about armadillos, of course, is this kind of big trek that they have made uh, across the state. So here are two maps. These, this was published uh, by David Schmidley in um, his book on the natural history of Texas. And you can see that Texas um, A, we're looking at, you know, early by eight, you know, the 1800s, and then we move into about 2002, um, there's that map there. So we've even extended, you know, further into West Texas. The earliest reports of our extant species um, date from the late 1840s. And uh, by 1900, they were present across the Edwards Plateau. And then we actually have an official report from one along the banks of Onion Creek in Travis County. So I'm interested in deep time. And so, you know, we need to think about armadillos and you know what it was like you know before uh, we see you know seen this kind of growth in and um, not only the kind of distribution of armadillos as they march across the straight the state but also just the growth of our own cities and suburbs here in Texas and so here are just three records of what we call sub fossil remains so uh, we're not looking at stuff that's very old you can kind of call them very old bones and um, I, I do want to point out Miller's Cave is an interesting site. This is a, a bone that came out of a brown clay layer that's been dated at you know, a little shy of 3,000 years ago. Um, so some of the information about armadillos, you know, not coming into the 1840s, you know, we really need to kind of look at the fossil record to kind of think about, you know, um, how, you know, exact is that, that information. And then there's the McKinney Homestead. So those of you that to have been to McKinney Falls State Park, there's a record of an armadillo that, you know, could be as old as, you know, 97 you know, years. So armadillos, you know, we, we do get a little bit of some of these old bones in our record. What makes the story of nine-banded armadillos so interesting is that there is a Pleistocene species called Dazipus bellus. So again, our nine-banded is Dazipus novum cinctus. Dazipus bellus means beautiful armadillo. And I'll, I'll show you an image of some of the fossils here in a sec. But Dazipus uh, bellus, our beautiful armadillo, essentially it looks exactly like a nine banded armadillo, but about twice the size. And it was present within Texas during you know, the last ice age. And so when we start looking at the data, so this map is uh, from this fabulous paper where um, Shapiro and her gang collected data of beautiful armadillo fossils. And so we've got the black dots are all these localities. So there's Miller's Cave there. 
uh, and compare that to what we see as the current range of our nine banded armadillo in the dark gray. The light gray is uh, the projected expanse because now we're seeing, you know, armadillos popping up into places that uh, we hadn't seen them before. You know, so you see that Tennessee has become all of a sudden a hot spot um, for armadillos. But looking at the fossils and looking at the ranges, um, some of the results of their research indicate that we might have to reconsider whether or not the Pleistocene species that we call beautiful armadillo might in fact actually be the same species as our nine banded armadillo. And it, that this single species, if we were to accept that, is actually um, an armadillo that is very adaptable in terms of body size and response to climatic change. We're already seeing that in our extant species, right? So we're seeing this great movement and with you know climate change, you know, this is going to continue. So here I mentioned uh, Dazipus bellus. So again, looks just imagine just a giant nine-banded armadillo. Here are some of the osteoderms. So those are the bones that make up you know the the bands and the bucklers there to give you an idea of size. We've got you know several locations in Texas where we can actually find fossils of them. And this is just to give you a list. I'm not expecting you to read them, but mostly just to give you an idea that, hey, we've, we've got several species, uh, several sites where the fossils have been found. And I do want to point out one right here, Lobock Cave, number three in Williamson County. For those of you who've been to Interspace Cavern, that's the cave. That's the original name of the cave when the uh, excavations were done and when it was first discovered back in the 1960s. And we actually have a radiocarbon date from um, some of the, the fossils that have come out of that cave, not specifically from the beautiful armadillo there, but we're looking at this animal being present in central Texas, you know, 23,000 years ago, so during the last ice age. So again, I bring this up because it's an interesting thought to think that, ah, this species that we've come to know and love, uh, if we agree that the beautiful armadillo is just essentially a large, Ice Age version of the same species has been around for, you know, well over 20,000 years. Fascinating, just absolutely fascinating. So the other extinct armadillo relative I want to point out that not as closely related to our nine banders as our, uh, the beautiful armadillo is something that we call a glyptodont. And that means carved tooth. So glypt meaning carved odont, when you see that in, in scientific uh, words always means tooth. And the name comes from um, just a description of the teeth that look more, instead of being like pegs, they're kind of cut, diagonals cut into them. And so that's where that carved comes from. So the skull is really short snouted. They're really uh, recognizable by these giant kind of flanges of bone that come up the cheeks. Those are for muscle attachment. And so they were processing probably uh, much more plant material. So different from armadillos, the glyptodonts were primarily herbivorous and so had, you know, kind of modifications of skull, these adaptations that allowed this kind of, sh uh, kind of uh, shredding and, and, and grinding of grasses. They've got this giant carapace. So glyptodonts kind of stand out because you don't see the bands in the middle. So it looks like one giant shield or one giant buckler. And each of these osteoderms, each of these single bones are really characteristic. And they got this kind of little rosette, little flower pattern. And that's how we can recognize individual you know, glyptodonts because quite often in the fossil record, we don't get the whole skeleton and we might get just an isolated osteoderm. And so that kind of beautiful fl flower pattern is really um, identifiable for us. So I bring up the glyptodonts because we've got this fabulous shell here and, and tail uh, of a glyptodont, glyptotherium, which is the, one of our Texas glyptodonts that was living here during the last ice age. It's uh, kind of front and center in our ice age exhibit here at Texas Memorial Museum. That particular shell uh, came from Ingleside, so in San Patricio County. So it was uh, part of a, a huge assemblage of um, sloths and um, pampathirs and, and, and other wonderful Ice Age creatures that came from a site that was actually discovered by a Works Progress Administration crew that was digging caliche to build roads um, during the uh, 
during the depression. So the road team actually made the find there in Ingleside. It's also called the Tedford pit. If you look at some of the, the older literature, but that is where this individual came from. But I also want to point out that locally from that same cave where we get the beautiful armadillo, we have some of the osteoderms that we that show that we had glyptodonts here as well. Uh, what's interesting about glyptodonts is that the distribution is primarily kind of Gulf coastal. So we have a really large um, sample that comes out of Florida and a, a great sample uh, out of Texas. And it was thought initially that, that these animals were um, kind of tied to more um, kind of riparian or uh, wetland environments, but there's been some kind of reevaluation, especially when uh, looking at some of the glyptodonts, which are much more diverse in South America, and looking at the possibility that instead what they were, were more open environment and, and feasting on the grasses in the areas, and especially when we think about, you know, um, Ice Age in Williamson County, we think about glyptodonts and um, giant armadillos, and so that looking at and looking at other fossil assemblages, it seems to indicate that, yeah, they were kind of these open area um, environment uh, living creatures, kind of similar to what we're seeing um, in South America today. And then here's Miller's cave again. Um, we've got Glyptodon that came out of there. So it's, it's interesting that some of these fossil sites um, are preserving our kind of our armadillo record pretty well here locally. So, when we think about, you know, the giant shells that we've seen in the glyptodonts and then kind of move forward, so fast forward to um, kind of modern day times, we think about, well, those shells are just extraordinary, right? And again, they're made of bone. And um, it always makes me think about this uh, really uh, interesting business called the Appelt uh, Armadillo Company. And it was in Comfort, Texas, in operation uh, from 1889 to 1971, and um, their heyday was in the 1930s. And so this is actually an advertisement from Popular Science in 1934, and where uh, the uh, company is uh, advertising that you could get an armadillo lampshade, you could get armadillo baskets were all the rage, and you still see a lot of armadillo baskets out there. And if you haven't done this, get out on the internet and just like search for armadillo art or armadillo baskets. And, uh, you know, people today are still, you know, utilizing armadillo materials or the armadillo shape or the armadillo kind of essence uh, become, you know, so important and so kind of ingrained in kind of our Texas uh, way of being. You know, you just kind of look around, you've got all the, you know, obligatory taxidermy, Armadillos drinking, we've got you know, armadillo gunslinger ceramics, uh, we've got beautiful armadillo street art here you know, on murals. So, you know, really they become part of, you know, our culture and, and uh, more of a whimsical uh, part of our culture in many ways. And then, of course, you know, we're thinking about the weather. February, we just kind of missed Groundhog Day, or in this case, you know, here in Texas, we've got kind of Armadillo Day with BK Bob that took on Punxsutawney Phil in terms of predicting and prognosticating, thinking about the weather. Uh, I was really sorry that uh, Bob didn't uh, couldn't come out and entertain the crowds because you know, we're still dealing with the COVID year. Uh, I do have to kind of ask about the um, the early spring because after last week. I certainly wasn't feeling it last week, that early spring, and I think Punxsutawney Phil actually got it right this time. But we did have an 80 degree day, though, did recently. So, we, you know, BK Bob may actually be right this year. That's fingers crossed, everybody, right? Fingers crossed. And to end um, and uh, open up for questions, I just want to end by uh, reading some of the language from House Concurrent Resolution number 178 which again was uh, signed by Governor George W. Bush in 1995. And I just wanna read you the language to, to end my talk today. And uh, this is the language about why uh, the armadillo should become our, our small state mammal of Texas. The armadillo possesses many remarkable and unique traits, some of which parallel the attributes that distinguish a true Texan 
such as a deep respect and need for the land, the ability to change and adapt, and a fierce undying love for freedom. And with that, I thank you and I, I look forward to answering your questions. That was great. Thank you so much. So much good information there. I think that was, that was great. Um, we do have a lot of questions here, and so I'll start going through them. Some we'll be able to do kind of rapid fire. Some of them are a little more in depth. Um, folks, if you have more questions, add them to the Q&A. We'll get to as many of them as we can. And then, of course, you could take down um, Dr. Owen's uh, contact information there and, and follow up with her if we don't get to any questions. So the first question came up right at the beginning when you were talking about the family tree. And um, it said, how come the anteater and the sloths don't have any kind of shell or armoring? Oh, that's a fabulous question. So let me give you a little interesting uh, information about extinct sloths. So uh, when we look at, so today we think about tree sloths. We, we've got the two, uh, Bradypus and Colipus are their names. So the two-toed and three-toed sloths. Uh, we, we, uh, we don't really think about yeah, any armor and we don't think about, you know, they're giant cousins very often, unless you're, you know, really into the ice age. But uh, some of their ice age relatives, including a species uh, called Paramylodon harlani, which is a, a, a sloth that we had here in Texas. And we have a beautiful skeleton that came out of that Ingleside site from the, cor uh, the coast you know, near Corpus Christi. It's on exhibit at the museum. What has been found with that particular um, species is that embedded in the skin, so in the dermal layer, are these small, um, I kind of the olive pit sized little osteoderms. And that's really what they look like. And so some of the giant ground sloths of the last ice age actually had some hidden armor. And it's these little bone, again, just imagine having a whole series of little olive pits embedded in your skin, especially along the back. Um, they actually did have some armor. And so it's interesting that there obviously is some genetic coding that uh, initiates some kind of armor growth. I don't think anybody knows the answer to whether or not, you know, this is something that's ancestral to the group. And, you know, I would say yes, given that we see these little weird little osteoderms in the skin of extinct ground sloths. It's just that that particular gene that codes for that or genes probably, it's probably a very complex suite of genes, um, has been turned off and um, just not something that we see in the, the anteaters and the, the living sloths of today. But um, our armadillo branch of that family tree has retained that um, uh, set of uh, characteristics and, and I think much to their advantage. Very cool. Um, this next question came up in several different um, configurations, so I'll kind of combine a few of them. Um, it was, what is the armadillo's main sense out of the five senses? And then we had some folks ask, why are their ears so big? Um, can they see? Do they have smell? So kind of all together. So they're, they have a great sense of smell. And so they're utilizing that um, as they're doing their rooting. So, and what's great is they have a, you know, really elongated snout. So they've got kind of extensive kind of mucosa that allows them to take those kind of olfactory particles back into the brain. Uh, they have relatively, you know, good hearing. Their sight is probably their weakest sense. Um, so uh, I would, you know, I would put smell as, as, as number one, most definitely. Okay. Um, how far down can they dig? Do you have any idea how far those burrows go? So some of the burrows, I think um, I've seen them um, described as um, maybe uh, a few feet down, but they, what they, instead of depth, especially if you're uh, digging along riverbanks, is, is extension. So some of their burrows may extend, you know, upwards of 16 feet in length. So it's not so much the depth for them. So it could be, you know, pretty surface. And the, and the openings are really large enough to get their body through. So you're looking at, you know, what, um, eight or nine inches, right? Um, and then maybe just a few 
you know, handfuls of centimeters down or maybe a couple of feet down. Again, it's going to depend on, on the soil, but really it's the extension um, in terms of um, having uh, openings for, for multiple burrows that will go into sort of the main chamber. So it's, yeah, more extension than depth is, is the key with them. That's why a lot of people don't want, want them digging under decks or under your house. It's, it, it's because of that, ex, it's the extension. Okay. Um, the next one came up uh, several times as well, and not, it may be too early to know, but it says, you know, bats didn't fare too well in this recent freeze. How did the armadillos do? Too early to tell. So here, here's the, so, but yeah, because it, it made me worry about, especially as I started thinking you know, about my talk and I thought, man, armadillos are just gonna take a beating with this cold. Um, so uh, I don't know, I, I'm, I'm glad we've moved out of it. I'm hoping that we didn't have, I'm hoping that, be, that because the burrows were already, you know, in place and that armadillos are um, often, you know, will stay in a burrow even when the weather is not as inclement for days at a time before maybe coming out and eating the feed that the, if the pregnant females, you know, just kind of held on and we didn't have any early births this month. Uh, and that, you know, most of the births are going to happen in March, which is pretty typical. We, we really won't know, but, you know, it's, it's thought that the distributional limits, so we're seeing that range is continuing to expand, right? So now we can see that they've appeared in the southern tip of Illinois. Now, will they stay there? Will they be permanent components of their wildlife, you know, their fauna? Hard to say, um, but really that limiting factor is going to be that lengthy, lengthy cold and then also um, soil type and, and water. But yeah, time will tell on that. It's, I will be, you know, distressed if I don't see, you know, or hear armadillos running around here by the time spring really get, kicks into gear. Okay. The next one is several that I'm also going to combine together because it got asked several times is, what is the leprosy risk in handling armadillos? And then would eating them expose other creatures or humans to it? So what's interesting about leprosy, and um, I, I figured I'd get a question about it. Uh, so uh, I'm, I um, didn't want to launch into it too long because I wanted to make sure that we had plenty of time for questions. But uh, I always think about it when we think about, you know, eating armadillos. And so here, here's the interesting story. And again, we kind of get into this whole deep time. And it's a reminder about human wildlife relationships and interactions is that first off, so the bacterium that causes leprosy. So it's a, it's a um, mycobacterium. Uh, it is not you know, native to the Americas. So people brought the bacterium that causes Hansen's disease is what we call the, the disease itself, um, leprosy. And it was humans that infected our armadillos. And so we do know looking at the populations in uh, Southeast Texas and in Louisiana that we do see armadillos, the populations uh, do have leprosy. And it was first detected in 1975. And so we know at some point, somehow armadillos, that bacterium was transferred to them probably from, from people because uh, we do know that there's a, you know, humans, chimpanzees, uh, we do know that mangabe monkeys, apparently there was a transmission probably from humans, uh, that we don't see leprosy, that bacterium kind of widespread in, you know, the animal world, um, but notably, you know, it's something that we see in the human population and now in armadillos. And uh, we're now seeing it in uh, armadillos in Brazil. So it's 2002, it's a different species, Euphractus, I think is the, is the, is the type of armadillo that they're seeing this in Brazil. Uh, there is a chance because they're in, in the population. It's the data that seem to indicate that if you regularly you know, hunt and process and eat armadillo, it does up the chances of you possibly then contracting the bacterium that, 
that causes Hansen's disease. Um, the CDC has got a fabulous website that kind of describes all this. It's, it's relatively um, hard to get uh, and very easily cured. Uh, so it's something that, you know, here, here's the, so I have touched a wild armadillo. I've petted one, you know, just reached out just to you know, do that. But you know what? I wash my hands. So it's just like dealing with any other ant animals, like wash your hands. So I can't tell you that there is zero chance. Um, there is a chance. And so if you are a regular consumer of, of wild armadillos, then you um, have an increased chance of, of getting um, infected with the bacterium that, that causes the Hansen's disease. Great. Um, the next couple of questions came when you started talking about reproduction and, and young. Um, the first one is, do fire ants uh, cause problems to young armadillos? They can. Um, fire ants seem to be, have, you know, cause more havoc with some ground nesting birds and with uh, horned lizards and things. I don't know if I've read any data that that uh, specifically documents fire hazard, uh, fire, fire ants as uh, being um, a problem with the armadillo population. So that would be something I would have to investigate to, to actually you know, answer that question. Okay. The next one's interesting. It's something that I haven't thought of before, but um, when the young leave their mom, one part of it is where do they go? And the second part of that is are armadillos territorial? It's funny, you know, there's a, we don't know a lot about armadillo activity and what's going on and, and like we don't recognize what all is happening, you know, obviously underground. We do know from some field studies that the young do kind of hang around with mom for a time. Um, and that's most, and, it, and that's after they've been weaned. Um, it might be a little bit of that. Mom's picked out this fabulous territory where there's plenty of water and plenty of food, and so they're slowly going to disperse. But you know, once they are of uh, reproductive age, they're going to they're going to move out, right? They're going to move out and um, uh, look for mates. It, I don't think anybody's documented any kind of territorial behavior, like actual um, aggressions, I think you get this kind of you know, dispersal. And again, it's going to be you know, food and water resources and, and the soil type. So I think I mentioned that if you've got some nice sandier soils that you can have, you know, a couple armadillos take over, you know, a couple acres. But if you're in kind of clayey soil, you're going to have a lot more acreage and fewer, you know, armadillos. And so a lot of it is just, um, you know, resource and, and then just that natural dispersal uh, to take advantage of resources. Okay. All right. I think you covered this one a little bit in, during the talk, but um, why do you suppose the nine banded armadillos are not expanding into the West, like New Mexico and Arizona? Um, water. I think a lot of that's going to be water because where, we see um, the lack of expansion here in the state of Texas. So, you know, you know, far west Texas and in the far western edge of the panhandle, it's the, I think it's the aridity is the, the big issue. Uh, so they are, you know, tied to water and um, that seems to be kind of one of the big indicators. And they also kind of use those uh, river and stream pathways as, you know, ways to, to move out. But I think, yeah, moving farther west, I think it's just getting too dry for them. All right. Um, next up we have, are there any pain receptors in their armor or in their plating? So yeah, so not in so much in the armor, but in the connective skin, uh, that's that where the armor attaches. So um, again, since it's kind of, it's loose, so, there's probably you know, that minimal, so the keratinous part is not, that's gonna be more of a shielding, but in the internal bone itself, and then in that, that, that flesh, from what I understand, where it attaches to the rest of the body, that's where most of those pain receptors are. Um, they can suffer some damage to the shell, 
and um, and and it can be mended and um, and they do just fine. Uh, the big arm, the big glyptodont that uh, we have at TMM actually has a paleopathology. It has what looks like a big dent or something. I don't know if something smacked into it or some part of the bone got infected, but it actually has looks like a healed injury to the shell. And uh, so they are capable of, of um, you know, with some minor injuries, you know, going forward and, and, and surviving. I will say that in the wild, you know, their, their lifespan's not terribly long. It's about five to seven years. In captivity, obviously it's a little bit longer, but, you know, the young have to kind of get through that, you know, that, that soft baby, you know, period to get through. But once they become adults, it's thought that in the wild that they're living about five to seven years. Okay. Next up was a follow-up on the uh, the territory or range question is, if I remove, a, 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 if I track one, how far should I take it to relocate it or any advice on that? Uh, I would um, double check with um, Texas Parks and Wildlife, but it's my understanding that uh, relocating wildlife is not something that um, is, re is recommended. Good deal. <laughs> um, <laughs> yep. Like I would consult with a wildlife professional on that. If if you have if you have issues with uh, armadillos, you know, I, I would just contact a wildlife professional on the best way to, to deal with that. Great. Okay. So regarding the beautiful armadillo, is there any evidence that the changing climate has resulted in a change in our nine-banded armadillo's size? So, I mean, that's part of the kind of this general overarching hypothesis that what we're seeing is um, if we're going to, if we're going to accept that the beautiful armadillo and the nine banded armadillo is one and the same species, is that, yeah, that we're seeing a species that is capable of responding to climatic change. And some of those responses uh, include, you know, being having a larger larger body size and being able to uh, successfully live in more northern regions of, of North America, obviously. Okay, and then are the glyptodons found all over Texas in typical fossil locations for that time period, or are the ones that you listed the only known sites? Those are the known sites that for this particular species. Yeah. Now we have some older glyptodonts. Uh, from the Pliocene that come out of West Texas, but I only showed the distribution um, of our kind of our Pleistocene, our more more recent geologically, uh, our Pleistocene forms. But the glyptodonts actually came into North America from um, South and Central America, uh, well, you know, over three million years ago. Okay. So they have a little bit, you know, so. As a whole, if we look at armadillos, that whole family, uh, including the glyptodonts, they have a, a really rich and a deep fossil history here in Texas. We're quickly running out of time, so I'm going to get to one more question, and then I'll let Johanna wrap it up if she has anything to add. Um, do we know the survival rate for the quads of M armadillo? And then what are the young called? Are they pups? Oh, man. I, I don't know what they're called. <laughs> I hope somebody will chime in if they know. I don't know. I, I, that's really funny. You think I I've would? I've always I would... referred to them as pups, but I, I, you know, I'm not sure. Yeah, I always call them. You know, they're, they're young, but I've never. Yeah, I, mean, I think anybody would accept anything. I think pups would be probably more acceptable than say somebody wanted to call them kits or like, what do you call baby anteaters? <laughs> See, that's something similar. So yeah, I, I don't know. And so the question about their survivability, I don't have um, numbers off the top of my head, but the young do kind of have it much harder. So uh, we do know that there's a lot more evidence now that they are actually you know, killed by feral hogs, that we're, we're seeing some documentation within Texas of that feral hogs, among the other things that feral hogs do. Um, do consume them, but
but they make great prey items for raptors and you know mammalian carnivores and so like a lot of young other you know mammals that um, they do have that higher incidence of, of um, uh, not making it into adulthood but i don't have a, a a number off the top of my head okay and that's about our time johanna do you have anything to add at the end if we didn't get to your questions feel free to contact us or dr owen and we'll, we'll see what we can do for you yeah, please send me an email. I'm happy to answer any questions. And uh, yeah. thanks for choosing to spend some time learning about armadillos today. <laughs>